Oh, um, the call, the session will be recorded so that by remaining on the call, you're consenting to uh, appearing on uh, a recording that that'll be uh, posted onto the internet on YouTube. Uh, if you uh, uh, make any contributions to the uh, to the session, so for example, um, uh, if you uh, speak and your screen pops up, uh, it'll show your your face and and your name. So so if uh, you participate in that way, you automatically consent, and uh, you won't receive any compensation. Um, during the during the session, uh, we'd ask everybody to put their microphones on mute. Uh, so as to uh, reduce the background noise. And um, we ask that you either raise your hand or submit uh, questions by uh, comment in the chat room. And uh, Leanne, Val, Eric, and I will, will vet those questions and uh, pose them to the presenters uh, during the session at appropriate times. Okay, so I will now hand it off to Bob Stewart to introduce Dan. Uh, Bob, I'm going to ask Bob, you're you muted. Unmute, unmute. I thought I was ready, but I wasn't. Anyway, so Dan um, grew up in Colorado, and from an early age, when his friends were playing baseball and football, he was more likely to be found up to his elbows in go karts and snow machine repairs of some sort. And by the early 2000s, Dan had moved to Bellingham and was working in the auto body repair business specializing in, in the painting aspect of that. Um, he was also doing some work on the side, repairing small, uh, small boats for extra money. His proficiency with automotive painting led him to a job with Sherman, Sherwin Automotive as a paint sales technician, consulting and advising the industry from California all the way to Alaska. By 2007, Dan had moved to Maui where he put his expertise to work for Sandwich Island Composites, building uh, and repairing SUPS, um, then ultimately to Kaiva'a Canoes, building and repairing the Scorpius uh, series, the Antares, the Ares canoes that were at that time still being built there, not in China. Uh, by the time I met Dan in 2010, he was Kai Bartlett's main repair person. In 2014, Dan moved back to the Pacific Northwest and along with establishing his own canoe repair business in Bellingham, he also worked for Pocock in Seattle building the elite racing shells with which some of you might be familiar. Uh, Dan had done some excellent repairs for me and in 2016 on my recommendation, Estelle Matheson took her hurricane to him. They met then, started dating, and last year they got married in COVID in a very small COVID-19 influence ceremony. While still dating on one of Dan's frequent visits to Vancouver, I took him to a Canucks hockey game, his first ever hockey experience. It was fun for me to explain some of the basic rules like offside and icing, et cetera, but on a delayed penalty when the Canucks had pulled the goalie for the extra skater, a pretty common event for the, the hockey aficionados that we are. They, the play came back into the Canucks end and upon noticing that there was no one in goal, Dan almost jumped out of his skin. <laughs> there might've been uh, an F-bomb involved in his uh, excitement. Where the, is our goalie? Anyway, now Dan is in the process of putting the necessary documentation in place so he can work in Canada, which has been quite a lengthy process and not made any easier by the pandemic. It will, however, eventually get done. And by that time, he and Estelle hope to be living in Cowichan Bay, which will be our loss and Vancouver Island's gain. So Dan might not know a lot about hockey, but he certainly knows his way around outrigger repairs. So without further ado, I introduce Dan Hunt to the CORE Virtual Town Hall meeting. Hey everybody. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate that. Um, so I guess from here, we'll just have questions come my way and, um, we'll go through those slides and, uh, I can explain as I go. I mean, Eric and I will just kind of work back and forth and, um, and we'll start from there. All right. Uh, so just to, just a sound check. So Dan, can you hear me? Yep. I can hear you. Okay. So I'm going to advance to the first slide. <clears throat> With me now. 
All right, so uh, Dan, why don't we start with this? This is a uh, Kahi Kai, and uh, maybe just tell us a little bit about what's going on here. We're going to do a Cook's tour, everyone, of uh, of kind of uh, what I would consider substantive repairs to OC1s, and Dan's going to basically narrate some of these images so that you have an understanding of what's involved in substantive repairs. So Dan, maybe tell us a little bit about what's going on with this boat. Okay, so on this, um, I don't have, I didn't have a photo of it prior, uh, but what this looked like before was it looked like a hairline fracture going down and, and also you know, horizontally with a canoe. And you'd first look at it and you'd think, okay, that's just something that you might want to, that some people would just put tape over. Um, but that's not what you should do with this. When you when I went to go push on it, you would actually hear you it would make a cracking sound in the foam. So that what you see in the yellow there is all divinacel, um, H80 probably divinacel foam, and that crunching sound you hear is if the fracture is right here, you're hearing that foam uh, kind of kind of uh, hitting each edge of that fracture. That foam is just uh, cracking, rubbing up against each other. And meaning that, you know, because that's a sandwich material, that's, that's a fracture. It's the, the strength is compromised. And the way to get that fracture removed is by grinding out that grinding the fracture out and then feathering it back. And so what feathering means is taking the foam or taking paint, taking carbon, whatever it may be, and you're slowly, you're, you're sanding it away till it becomes tapered. And so that's what you see here. You see, if you were to kind of draw a line down the, down the center of, of, of this repair, you know, horizontally and also vertically, you, you'd see that it was, you'd see that it was, um, that it took quite a bit to feather that back. And so- yeah. And I think it'd be helpful just because this is a cross-sectional picture of where in the boat this was. Like, where was it situated on the hull? This was this was on the tail. Um, this was on the tail, maybe about a foot and a half in front of the rudder. Okay, um, and it, 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 on, sorry, it presented to you as what kind? Like, how did it look first before it? Like, did it just look like a crack? Or a puncture. What caused the the customer to bring it into you? What was the concern? It looked it was it looked like a, a fracture. You know, okay. it looked like just a hairline crack. Um, and at first glance, you wouldn't think anything of it. But when you go to push on it and it starts making that crunching sound, that's when you know this is a, a, a substantial uh, this is substantial damage and it needs to be repaired correctly. And this is the, uh, it's hard to see here, but the end result is pretty much invisible, yep. <laughs> but it's, it's done in, in a correct way. So we'll move on to this one now, Dan. Uh, yep. So maybe first tell us, uh, I can see the Venturi there, so we sort of know where it is on the boat, but maybe yep. tell us again how the customer presented. What was the concern with this one? <clears throat> this one was, this one was a, a warranty, uh, not a warranty, but it was, a, it was damage and shipping for Kamanu. And uh, it had a you know a fracture that happened in shipping, which I mean everybody's canoes you know that happens um, sometimes. So with this one, it was a hairline fracture, and uh, it was near you know near the cockpit near the seam, and um, same thing you got to feather that fracture out, and then from from this point up, I, I then did you know three layers of carbon uh, for as a layup. And uh, and let that you know then sanded that down and profiled it down to be even with the surface like that. Dan, then, yep. When you say sand it down, do you do that by hand or do you use a machine to sand it down? Uh, to I go I I start off with a grinder um, with a four and a half inch grinder, and I use that to knock off all the highs that are that are on the carbons you know maybe sticking up a little bit, but something like this, um, well, after, after I hit it just a little bit with the grinder, then I move to a block, sandpaper, and then I block it down by hand. 
I think it, I think it's important, uh, Dan, and for the audience to know that you know you can stick some tape over a fracture or a crack or a puncture to get you back to the dock or get you back to the shore. But mm -hmm. when Dan mentions things like grinders, these are not generally things that you should try yourself. And maybe Dan, I can. Uh, I know that you and I have talked about this. <clears throat> the risk the risk of using this kind of equipment on a boat as delicate a, a, as this can you can get some bad outcomes if you don't know what you're doing. Oh yeah, I mean if you if you have the grinder at just a slight degree off and you go to grind uh, out a, uh, a ding in your in your canoe, you could literally go right through it within a matter of seconds. So it's really, a, it, it's, it's not something that anybody wants to attempt just, you know, casually. It's, uh, it could, it could really compromise your, your canoe instantly. So, so here, this started off as a hairline fracture. Uh, you then have feathered it out and you, you appear to have placed uh, a couple of layers of carbon fiber over top of it and maybe tell us at what stage of the repair is this? At this point here, this is me profiling that carbon back down to back down to the original surface. And uh, from this point forward, I would then uh, sand around the sand around where you know where my uh, tape line is and um, get it in primer and then uh, and then gel coat from there. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's move on to uh, something that's a little bit more uh, elaborate, involving a wider range of a material. So maybe explain to people what core mat uh, and mat roving uh, is for the for the audience. Okay, so what you in the last two slides we saw we saw uh, the sandwich material being um, a divina cell foam. Um, in this. This is core mat, which is which is another uh, uh, sandwich material, and um, it almost works the same way. It's a lot, it's a little bit easier to work with. Um, it's a bit tough to get it to soak in all the resin when doing a layup, but um, it does lay down a lot nicer than uh, foam does when doing the layup. Um, this required core mat um, for the repair, and uh, that's what you see here. And prior to getting this this core mat into the repair, um, because it was it was a pretty substantial fracture, uh, I did I did a did this layup twice. So I laid in the, the laid in the core mat, saturated it, and vacuum bagged it down. Then feathered around my edge, and then I did my carbon layup over that, and uh, then hit the paint process from there. It's kind of my hand there to kind of give you a reference of what size it is, even though I've got little stubby sausage hands. <laughs> so, so Dan, actually, uh, Rob, uh, Bob Stewart has a question. Go ahead, Bob. Um, can you, can, so this is in a gel coat, or like a Kamano boat, or um, with a free preg uh, construction, can you, is that a uh, similar uh, method for repair? Um, well, the, the two slides before, those were pre-preg built canoes. And this, this is a Kamanu. So that's, oh, okay. that's, that's, a, that's a Kamanu um, a canoe. So it's, it's not pre-preg. It's the, you know, lay up on the table, drop into the mold, put in your sandwich material, and then uh, keep your layup, and, and then the, continuing on with your layup. So the, so the repairs uh, are similar for, for regardless of the... Of the layout? Yeah, it's 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 it yeah, it's similar. It's basically what is the sandwich material and what's the uh, what's the best way to bring back its strength. So Dan, I think it's interesting that your hand is a good reference point because what a paddler may think of as a minor sort of uh, puncture or hairline crack, you can see by the size of the hand what's required to restore structural integrity to a hull. So it's not just a question of fixing a one inch strip. You have to, as you say, feather the, uh, distribute the amount of repair over a wider surface area in order to make sure that that boat is safe going forward. Correct, correct. Because it's a matter of how far 
that sandwich material was fractured. So when you push on, when, if you can go back to the other slide, when I yeah. pushed on this repair to figure out how extensive it was, I basically pushed on it and on the outside perimeter of where that uh, white core mat is, that's where the the indentation of the of the of the re, of the damage extended to here. So it extended to that outside circle. So that's it's the repair starts from that outside circle in, and it's a matter of then feathering it out to taper it to keep that repair strong. Thanks, Dan. And uh, you'll see in this next slide what it looks like when it's all finished. And uh, Dan likes painting. He's very good at painting. But for those of us who don't like painting, white boats rock. But uh, I here, yeah, exactly, I totally do. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a white boat, but this is uh, after uh, that. You know, uh, Dan's handprint was in the middle of all that, and this is the uh, the finished product. So uh, nice job. Thanks. Thanks. All right, so let's move on to this one. Uh, this is a, a, what, what Dan calls is a major fracture. And instead of the, uh, uh, the sandwich material as a, as a technique, we're gonna talk about vacuum bagging and maybe just tell people a little bit about what that is. So um, with this repair, <clears throat> if uh, <clears throat> I remember correctly, I think a garage door came down on that canoe. Um, and with that, it was because it's it's right underneath the co cockpit, and a lot of strength, a lo the strength of the OC one, really. I mean, it's it's all encompassing the whole the whole entire shell, the whole entire canoe. But there's a lot of um, pressure and strength being on the OC one being built around the cockpit, both underneath and the cockpit itself. So this had I really had. Every repair is super strong, but this had to be like it, it's a it's a very um, it's a it's a very substantial part of the of the of the OC, of the OC one. So it required vacuum bagging, and with doing that repair, um, it took a it had a major fracture. So it took a lot of feathering to get that all that crunched foam feathered out. Um, so, I mean, I, and I feathered it out even more than that, but with that repair that took, you know, a large amount of uh, carbon going from one end to the other and building up from there. Um, so the only way to really get that to, to, to be as strong as possible, and if not stronger than the rest of the rest of the canoe, it, it had to be vacuum bagged. And uh, maybe just so the audience knows what that is, uh, maybe just describe what you know, essentially you're you're removing air uh, as part of the curing process. But maybe talk to people about how what that what what's involved in doing that. What's involved in doing that is you're you're wetting out carbon, you're uh, wetting out multiple layers of carbon, and you're going from largest the largest piece inward, um, and once you lay that in into the repair. It's then vacuum bagging around it, and the way you know, vac what vacuum bagging does is, is, it pulls all the laminates together, compresses them together, as well as push out any unneeded excess resin uh, to keep to keep the repair light, and um, it's just it's uh, it, it's it makes for a, just a bulletproof repair. Yep. And, uh, and Dan, for here's another example of a boat that's not white. Far be it for me to, you know, <laughs> criticize multicolored boats, but here's the beautiful job. This is the finished product. So very nice job, Dan. Look at that. Thanks. Thanks. And this is why we take those things that just look minor, but then you can feel that little bit of denting. That's why we take them to professionals like yeah. Dan, because I've, I've tried to do this by myself. Do not recommend it to anybody. Take it to a professional. It's going to save you less, save you money down the road. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Basically anything, if anything smaller than like a loony, you, you need to, yeah, if it's making a sound, if it's making a crunching sound, have it looked at by a professional. Like it's, it's imperative because if you're in large, if you forget about having it checked out and you're in large water out there, 
and it hits you just right that fracture could could expand and that's you don't want to, you want you don't want to have that fracture expand to something much larger possibly compromise the the oc1 and you're stuck out in the middle of the channel it's not hey, this you want to be this is rick frazier can you hear me yep Hey, um, with the, the vacuum bagging, do you sand that down the same way you would the, uh, the carbon layers if you weren't vacuum uh, bagging? Yeah, I still do. I still do because it's still not going to be at the same. It's still not going to profile down. The, uh, right. You know, it's not going to fare the same way as, as the canoe itself. So it does take a little bit of grinding it, and it takes a lot of know-how in sanding um, because you don't want to sand too far. Uh, and are you just using an, an epoxy resin? Everything, <clears throat> everything is epoxy resin. Okay, thank you. Yep. So uh, Leanne mentioned that uh, that you know home repair <clears throat> jobs are, can uh, you know are are a bit of a uh, a tricky game, uh, but sometimes you can get your boat repaired by very well intended people who don't necessarily good uh, do a, uh, the best job, and. Uh, uh, what's next on this slide deck is an example of a job where someone repaired it before Dan got to it, uh, to the extent that it affected the, uh, the, the performance of the boat. So we're just going to go over here. Uh, oh, I got one too far. So maybe Dan, you can, this, I find this actually a fascinating story, but Dan, maybe tell us a little bit about this uh, Pueyo. So this um, was the tail of a poeo that looked perfectly fine. It was shiny, it was uh, smooth, you know, it looked great, color match looked great, um, but it was incredibly heavy. Um, so heavy that the paddler uh, who owned the canoe had to move the seat up in order to get it trimmed out because it was, you know, tail heavy. Um, so, I was approached to take a look at it. And uh, the first thing I did was take a grinder to it. And when my grinder went through, you know, a, a, a three sixteenths of an inch, almost to a quarter inch of Bondo, I realized that um, like, that's, that's just not the way to do it. Um, that's not a repair. So I dug deeper into it and realized that, um, that the fiberglass at the bottom of that plastic filler, bottom of that bondo was, was basically um, chop mat fiberglass, which is really just random hairs stuck together. That's it's it's what's used for building fishing boats um, and polyester resin. And sure, polyester will stick to a, an epoxy built uh, composite, but not as well as epoxy. It's just it's a uh, it's not a it's not a correct repair, so basically I chopped that tail off with a the handsaw in <laughs> seconds, um, and weighed it and it weighed it was five to five to six pounds. I think it was actually a little bit over than over six, and so from there <clears throat> forward, um, I took a, a, a used another poeo and uh, did a layup of of the tail, and then. Um, uh, both and then use that layup that new piece that new tail that I made and then I I installed it onto the, the that poeo and with uh, re there's there's the end result uh, uh, but my, I'm curious though if you chopped off the end of the poeo with a handsaw which must have felt a bit sacrilegious I admit mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, how how did you how did you uh, how far did you feather on the inside or against the outside of the hull to re to achieve the kind of strength you wanted? I went about a foot and a half, if I believe. I believe it was it was right. It was two inches past the the cup for the rudder um, T, right? So that's where I cut it. Though so from there forward. I went about a f I went about a foot foot and a half on the hull and deck to to taper it in and bring it all in together, and I also and, flanged it as well. So oh yeah. before 
Yeah. So before putting that new tail piece on, I had flanged the 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 inside so that the new pieces that I made would it would accept you know so it all accept and and be you know uh, line up together, and then from there did a did a large layup, foot and a half past where the cut was. Thanks, Dan. Did the uh, did the owner of the boat was he able to move his seat back to where it belonged after all this? Hopefully. Yep. yep. <laughs> So I think we'll take a pause here and ask Val and Leanne, because I know that there's some questions have come in before we move to paint, because uh, we've talked about some structural stuff. I think Val and Leanne have a couple of questions in the doc that, uh, that we can uh, use as a bridge before we move over to paint. So uh, Leanne and Val, over to you. Yeah, one question that's come up uh, more than once, you, I mean, you did say that one way to know what needs to be repaired is the sound that it makes. But people buying secondhand canoes or people who have can, the, their first canoes, sometimes there's like just little divots in them. And sometimes it's, you know, like those little pucks in them. Like yeah. at what point do you know that you have to send it to be repaired aside from the sound? Are there other telltale signs that it's time to put it in the shop? Yeah, if, if, it's, an, if it's a used OC1, um, one of the first things that I would recommend doing is, is from from one end to to the other, you know, starting off with the hull and then and then going to the deck. But flip the flip the canoe over, start at the tail, and start just pushing your thumb just gently around the hull, looking for soft spots. And 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 anything that has is substantially soft, maybe not even making a crunching sound like if if, if it had you know sound it, the high density foam um, as a sandwich material. If, if you go around the canoe and, and, and find some major soft spots, that's when, that's when you wanna have it looked at by somebody and maybe, maybe even have, have it looked at before you know, finalizing the sale. Um, when it comes to small punctures um, that you see quite a bit, um, with those you, if there's not a fracture around them and it really is just a straight puncture, you know, for maybe a sharp rock coming in onto the beach, um, of course that needs to get filled with, with epoxy. Um, a lot of people use solar resin. I've never liked solar resin. I think it's a cheap, quick fix. Um, you're better off, you're better off with a small puncture grabbing five minute epoxy at your local hardware store and injecting that in. Um, does that answer your question? I, th I think so. Um, okay. Also, people are wondering, how do you tell if somebody is a reliable repair person and how much would you expect to repair for, uh, pay for repairs? Like, for example, I'm looking at the canoe that you literally sawed the back off at it. And I'm in my head, I'm like, isn't it cheaper to buy a new canoe? Um, yeah. So what would one expect to pay for repairs? Well, I'm kind of the one of the worst ones to ask with that because I've always <laughs> undervalued my work. Um, the best I, people are usually like that. You're like an artist. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, that's a hard, that's a hard question to ask, uh, or not a, a hard one to answer. Um, uh, I would say. Yeah, yeah, hourly hourly rate. You know what? The, what is their hourly rate? What does that include? Does that include all the materials? And what is what are the steps that they are going to take when repairing your canoe from the smallest ding to a major fracture? It's if if the word polyester comes up in the conversation, that's a red flag. Yeah. If it, because all of our OC1s, they're all epoxy. They're all, the, the only thing that's polyester is, is maybe the gel coat for the custom canoes that we built in Maui and, and Kimanos. But if they say they're gonna use polyester resin for a repair, that's when, that's when that's a red flag. If they're, okay. if they're gonna, if they, if when, when talking to them, if they say they're gonna use carbon, and an epoxy 
that's a good sign. Um, well, on, on, they, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Finish what you're. And, and the other one too is with with looking at a used OC one. The other one to also look at is is the seam. If it's a like you know, yeah. if it's one of the you know older you know traditionally built OC ones, if it's got a seam all the way around it, you kind of want to push on that seam a little bit too to make sure that that seam hasn't broken free. Because sometimes that 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 starts to happen with the older OC ones, so it's something to watch out for. Okay, and uh, Eric, do I have time for a few more of these questions before we move on? Because there's a few uh, of them. Yep, yeah, yeah. There's a, a couple. We have a few more minutes. Go ahead. Okay, good. So Michael's asking, what weight and types of cloth do you use in your repairs? Yeah, uh, I use I use four eight um, uh, carbon. Um, I'll sometimes finish off my layup with a piece of fiberglass with, a, uh, with some two ounce uh, S glass. And I use that as a guide, like a, as a guide to, to watch my sanding so that I can, I can see where's, where's my lows, where's my highs. And, um, and it's, it's kind of the, the fiberglass is kind of an, a sacrificial piece basically. Okay. And Jenny or Jeannie, I'm not sure which, uh, asked, can you just repeat uh, what epoxy resin to use? There's a lot of different types out there. Um, I, I, I personally use uh, West Systems because it's, it's always consistent. It's there. There's a lot of other great resins out there. Resin Research is a great resin. Um, it's a, uh, has a very low to zero amine in it, A-M-I-N-E. Uh, -A -A uh, amine is, uh, is kind of a byproduct in, in uh, epoxy, a, a product in epoxy that helps them cure. Uh, polyesters and amines don't like each other. Uh, any, any amine uh, saturated through the repair will stop a polyester from catalyzing almost every time. So, um, yeah, if it's, if you're at home in your garage, repairing a small, tiny ding on your canoe, something that's not making a sound, I'd use five minute epoxy. Um, anything, anything larger than that, that makes a, a, a sound, a fracture, it's, I would go have it looked at. Um, okay. And um, Ray, no. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to, I just want to point out for the audience that uh, Dan's going to be, uh, Dan's the lead act followed by Tristan, who's coming on a little bit later. And Tristan's going to actually show the audience the epoxy systems that we use at FGPC, which is the same stuff that Dan's referring to. So, and he's actually going to show people sort of very briefly how to mix it. Uh, you know, don't do this at home in your kitchen, but, uh, or, or uh, don't eat it anyway, but uh, he'll, he'll show you quickly uh, how to mix it. Uh, for some rudder repairs and stuff that we'll do toward the end of the end of this session. But uh, I think that um, Dan, a good segue over to the, the fancier paint sort of discussion uh, is this question that uh, if Val, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna ask it for you. Um, when is a boat, I'm gonna paraphrase, when has a boat met the end of its life? At what point do you as a repair person or somebody buying an OC1 take a look at a boat, no matter how desperate they are to own it, at what point do you look at it and say, you know what, it, it is not worth repairing. It's not worth restoring. How, where does that judgment fit for you? For me, that um, it falls into how soft is that OC1, surf ski, OC2, like how soft is it from one into the other? Um, and how much does it leak when you do a pressure test on it? You know, if it's, if it's, it tends to be soft all the way around, um, you could see that there's been multiple repairs done to it that are, that are shoddy. That's, that's a, that's a red flag because if you wanted to make sure that it was watertight and seaworthy, <clears throat> you'd probably have to redo all those repairs and, you know, when it comes to the cost of what it would take to redo all those repairs that were previously done, 
sometimes repairing somebody else's work makes makes for a lot more work in the end and uh, any business out there has to has to charge accordingly because it's it's a lot of times we, people will put um, product on their on their on their canoes that um, doesn't really catalyze it's just a paint that they picked up at a at a hardware store and because it never really is fully cured it may be dry to the touch and it covers nicely but it's brushed on the, the thing about it is it clogs up the sandpaper and it uh, it takes a lot of time to redo that repair because of clogging the sandpaper. So when you add in the time that it takes to, to, re, to re redo all those repairs, it has several soft spots. And it also is when doing a pressure test using, you know, I've always breathed into the canoes until there's some back pressure and then I tape off the hole and then I use soap and water to go around the seam, the irrigation line, the, the steering lines, whatnot. If there's multiple leaks also around the seam, around the steering cables, it, it, around the, the rudder shaft, I think as well as, as well as all the other damage that's been um, done to it basically by shoddy repairs, that's when it's time to maybe step back and, and getting yourself a new OC1. Thanks, Dan. Um, uh, Val and uh, Leanne, I think we'll have time for more questions, but let's move on to some of the glitzier stuff, which I think is paint. Uh, but uh, actually, I forgot about this one. Uh, Dan, yeah. can you, just because it has almost like a rowing shell construction to it, which I find intriguing, but maybe talk a little bit about this delamination, because that does uh, happen in some boats. Uh, I think surf skis, uh, older surf skis anyway. Yeah. So with this one, <clears throat> what um, it's a it's a surf ski. It's a black surf ski. I think everybody knows which you know which those which ones are the epic. You know, um, what happened with <laughs> right? So what happened with this one was um, it was it was dropped on the beach, and it wasn't dropped on 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 a rock um, like a bunch of rocks. It was basically dropped on a very smooth round boulder. And if it was maybe sharp, it would have just isolated the damage, but because it was this large boulder, it basically gave it a really expansive fracture. And what happens with these honeycomb, uh, honeycomb built uh, skis, and you know, I mean, there's probably some OC ones out there that built with honeycomb also, the surface area uh, around, uh, around the, the uh, the 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 comb itself is very little when it's actually touching the Kevlar uh, above and below it. So they when getting when getting hit, they do have a tendency to fracture and delam a lot more uh, draft uh, um, uh, just a lot more. So um, what? Uh, what this one entailed was was basically cutting out all that honeycomb, and um, and rebuilding that ski from that Kevlar up. Um, and Kevlar um, has a tendency to not accept resin as easily as carbon and fiberglass. So when when building anything with Kevlar, it's really imperative that you really impregnate that that Kevlar. So that you have a, a saturated material, so that it does really it bonds really well to the honeycomb, or core or core mat, or uh, or or foam definicel. Does that make sense? You're on mute, Eric. Uh, we're just, uh, th that does make sense. Uh, we're, let's look through a few of the, these are Pocock rowing shells, I think, aren't they? Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, th do they, uh, do they use honeycomb construction as well? Cause I know Felipe rowing shells do. I don't know if these do or not, but uh, I don't think many OC ones use uh, honeycomb or Kevlar for that matter anymore. Do they? No, not really. Not really. If, um, if you were really wanted to build just a super bulletproof OC six or OC one, um, I do, I do know a company that, uh, 
uses uh, <clears throat> Kevlar right down the right down the keel of the hulls on on their boats, and that I mean, if you hit anything, it, you're, it's not gonna it's not gonna uh, break in half, right? You got the Kevlar there. So yeah, if you go back to that the this previous slides, we're showing the foam. Okay, so I mean, this is the same foam that uh, a lot of OC ones are built out of. Um, and so the, what you see here, if you notice the color um, in between, in, like if, if you go each layer over, so there's one, two, three, four, and then four forward dip back towards the tail, that's um, those two different colors in foam right there are the difference in density of the foam. So you got H45 in the front here, and then you have H80 going towards the back. And so with building these, it's, uh, it's a it's a it's a two step layup. So once that whole mold is in, is gel coated, then we're doing, then we did our carbon fiber layup, um, and there's a multiple layup schedule for that, and then uh, and then it gets vacuum bagged down, and then you see here is the carbon fiber laid into that into that foam, and vacuum bagged, and then from there. The, you see all the different bulkheads that, um, yeah, so right there, that is, that is the second layup uh, for that shell. And that's, a, is that an eight? I can't tell. Yeah, uh, that's an eight. Yeah. yeah it's eight. So yeah, that's a, that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of strength you need in, in a, in a hull of that length. Yeah. Okay. Also, if you go back on that shell, the, for that, for those shells, they have a uh, the platform that your that your seat you know your seat rolls on. Those those platforms, those X platforms, are built out of honeycomb. That's that's about the only part that's made out of honeycomb for those shells. All right, so we're gonna go to Dan's uh, second uh, love before we move over to some questions, uh, and that is uh, paint. Uh, so. People who have clubs like Leanne and, and, and me and a few others on the call definitely have a preference for white boats. Uh, yeah. And that's simply uh, sheer pragmatism on our point, our, our part, but, uh, but uh, paint is a wonderful thing. So uh, maybe uh, Dan, just talk about what's involved in, uh, in painting and actually matching and replicating paint after damage to uh, boats that have, you know, that aren't white. Okay. Bay, uh, so, so from primer, okay, so from like, for, so for this Matahina, that's white gel coat. Um, the club wanted the top, the deck to be blue. Um, what requires to make that blue is a lot of work. And it may, may seem simple that we're just, that it's, you know, you're going from white to blue, but what it takes is, is a lot of, it, it takes a lot of work. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a matter of prepping the surface correctly, you know, using the correct sandpaper grit, uh, making sure the surface is clean before you sand so you're not embedding any contaminants into the sand scratch. And then once it's sanded, really making sure there's no shiny spots, or any, and zero, and zero shiny spots with Scotch-Brite and 320. Um, and then cleaning it again, masking it, Masking it with uh, fine line is the last step. So you can pull that fine line after it's painted so that the edge rolls over and is soft. Um, but it's also, it's also uh, may really making sure the surface is clean. So, you know, it takes wax and grease remover to prior to sanding, wax and grease remover after it's sanded, masking it, wax and grease remover again. Um, and for fiberglass canoes, you, I, I, after I use a solvent-based wax and grease remover, I then use, like to use a waterborne wax and grease remover because the waterborne removes the static because static is built with fiberglass um, naturally and static can attract dirt. So you really want to basically want to cut the static down and a waterborne wax and grease remover helps with that. Um, and then it goes to the point of, you know, then mixing the paint correctly and uh, and applying it correctly. Um, as far as applying it, uh, the best way to go about it is um, 
there's two different ver there's two different ways you can go about that. There's kind of the old school way of doing a drop. Um, what would you would be? I guess like I learned all in German paint, so I gotta the be the best way to do it would be do a drop coat over the whole entire surface. Let that tack up just a little bit, you know, a few minutes, and then do and then start, you know, your one layer after that. And keeping your patterns 50-50, keeping them consistent. Um, when painting something this large, you know, like a like a six, you basically want to you want to you want to visualize a grid over the surface and then step, you know, step to that grid as you're walking around it, and uh, really not uh, painting over the same area twice in the in the first go around because that's when you start to get runs. Um, and the other reason why you want to keep it really clean is so that there's no fish eyes and, um, you know, they, or the paint just doesn't want, the paint just wants to separate around from a contaminant. It's, it's just got to be super clean. And number one, when doing any paint work, you've got to make sure you have clean compressed air, clean, dry compressed air. So those are the important factors. Yeah, Dan, uh, uh, this is why white boats are so great. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 I couldn't agree more. But uh, uh, Dan, Dan uh, knows uh, Kai's uh, dad, uh, and uh, uh, Tom Bartlett's a, a, another practical mash unit kind of guy with respect to boat repairs, and he's a big believer in uh, white cans of appliance paint that you can get in Canadian Tire or off the shelf and, you know, in a pinch. You can do that, but of course that nowhere near matches the protocols that Dan is referring to that get the results like you see on this uh, particular uh, vessel over here in the picture, which uh, I think Dan, uh, was this a customer's custom request or what was it? That was, no, that was a, that was a prone that, um, that uh, custom built prone that we did at SIC. And he just wanted, he and he wanted that pattern. Um, but for me with paint work, it, uh, and as far as collision and as far as like auto body and whatnot, like I only did that because I needed to, you know, you need to generate, like, you know, provide for yourself, but it's not a, uh, not an industry I loved. Uh, I cared about paint work, but I, it's not an industry that um, um, I enjoyed. Um, my background with it was, was pretty extensive. Um, yeah, I mean, it, um, I have two, yeah, I'm going off topic, but so, yeah, it's, I know, it's I know so that, much more enjoyable. We've got, we've got some more questions in the queue. So uh, we've got a few more minutes. We've got about 10 more minutes before we hand it over to Tristan. So uh, Val and Leanne, I see some excellent questions coming through down the pipeline. So over to you guys for some questions for Dan. Okay, well, everybody's, sorry, go ahead, Leanne. I was going to say, while we're still talking about paint, um, because we're always like, or if you're like me, I'm always going to take it to someone that knows what they're doing to paint my boat. But Lisa is asking about paint care. Are they supposed to wax it or anything or just rinse and dry every time? Is there anything that they should do to look after the paint better? After coming out of the water paddling? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, when you come out, you come out of the water after paddling, just really make sure you hose it down. Um, you, you know, really wash off all that salt because the salt will have, will over time start to really dull out that clear coat uh, finish. The, um, you know, most of the canoes that we all paddle that are, you know, uh, built from oz for that ozone builds, the clear coat they use on the OC1s is, it's so bulletproof. Like it, it retains its gloss incredibly well. It's super strong. Um, yeah, but even that being said, really make sure you rinse off your, your OC, your OC1, um, your OC2, whatnot. Um, if, when it comes to waxing it, you, you want to wax it at least every six months, as long as you're keeping it clean. Um, and base, and, and I think everybody kind of knows how to do that. Just wipe on, wipe off and, um, and just, uh, Make sure you're using clean, dry cloth when taking the wax off. So, like a standard marine wax, or what kind of wax should they use? Um, if you're, 
like him. So I want to make sure I give some advice where I know people can get a good product at really any corner, you know, at Home Depot or parts store or whatnot. Um, Meguiar's makes a really nice hand glaze, a nice, a nice wax. Um, as far as uh, 3M, 3M makes a really nice uh, hand glaze. I can, I can find the part numbers and maybe, maybe um, uh, send them, you know, send them Ron or Eric's way. Um, That'd be great. Yeah. We can yep. put them in the session notes when we post the, post this up on the website. Oh yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, actually knowing, knowing that I'll, I'll put quite a bit up there. Thank you. Yep. Val, do you have some questions there on your list? I'm just going to interject here. I, that's my canoe. I didn't know it was coming up in the scroll, but I, I remember getting T-boned by a, a, an, o, an ocean rowing shell and taking the canoe down to Dan and he literally made my boat look like it did when I unwrapped it from the factory. It was unbelievable. Thanks, Bob. Um, and that, that there it is, I guess it's not quite ready for me to, to pick up yet, but that's, that was uh, such a good job, Dan. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. So uh, everyone's favorite photographer, uh, Jeff, as well as me, who happens to be a second photographer, has the same question. What steps do you recommend for repairing a small scratch that hasn't gone through the carbon and what paint tips would you recommend to finish it? Okay, so if it's a, a small scratch, um, I would recommend, hmm, I would recommend if, if it's just a scratch in, 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 you're talking just a scratch in the paint, Mm hmm. OK, I would I would try to find I would go to a, a, a auto parts store, the auto paint supply store and give them if it's a if, the, if it's an ozone built OC one or canoe, I would recommend um, going on to the color chart uh, on their website, pulling up what what code it is. Um, it'll be an RAL number and then give that RAL number to the auto paint store and, um, they should be able to mix you up some touch up for it. And, uh, I would recommend getting that touch up mixed in either a, uh, in either a base coat, um, which won't have quite that much shine or a, uh, or, or, or a single stage, uh, enamel. And, uh, and really, when when you're when you're in it, while you're there at the auto paint store, order yourself up a a, a Mac touch up brush. Um, it's basically a sword brush. It's what um, Von Dutch and those guys used to use for pinstriping back in the 40s and 50s. Um, it's still around. Mac makes a bunch of different types of brushes, but those brushes work really really well for for really just dropping in just the right amount of paint inside a scratch, especially the Mac touch-up brush. You can use a pinstriping brush, but the Mac touch-up brush works just as well. Um, and I hope that answers the question. Okay, so the, at the, the auto paint shops, they have those pens with the paint already mixed in them that you just shake and it, and mm -hmm. it comes with a brush and it comes with two kinds of um, sort of a little scratchy thing to sand an area, a very small area. Have you tried using those? Would you recommend those? I never have. I've never used those. Um, only because I've always, I've always just, um, I've always just had touch up brushes and, and paint on hand to, to use. Um, and the other one too, is if you have a scratch in, in, on your OC1, that scratch itself doesn't require sanding because that scratch itself is a sanded area. Right. So when it gets scratched, you're, that is abrading the surface. So when you go to touch it up, it's not, you don't have to really necessarily worry about that, that paint not sticking to that scratch because the scratch is basically abraded. Um, when you go to touch it up with a brush, um, I, tr if, if you have, you know, both sides of the scratch and this is a scratch here, 
There's really no reason to be putting paint outside that line on the scratch. If you use a touch-up brush and you just use just the tip, you'll be able to fill in that scratch, almost using a capillary effect, and then let go and the scratch is filled. Okay, and, and that goes for a scratch that is not going through the carbon, but that goes all the way down to the carbon. Yeah, that maybe goes all the way down to the primer or, you know, maybe just barely into the carbon. Okay. Yeah. And then there's a couple of questions on cleaning, like just uh, generally cleaning your canoes. There's somebody who's saying they use a blue goo from on it. And there's somebody else mentioning that um, they get uh, algae after paddles and the boat turns a sort of greenish hue. Mm -hmm. And what you might use to clean boats aside from water. Yeah, the blue goo is awesome. And that also works really, really well on your, on OC6s. Um, yeah, that stuff works great. Um, if you, if you have a tendency to get a lot of algae in the water that, that you're paddling in, and you do have that kind of green tinge to say a white canoe, um, you'd want to use like a, a Meguiar's cleaner uh, to clean that off because blue goo really works great for gel coat, but for paint, it doesn't work quite the same way. So because we're, because of a lot of our OC ones are all automotive paint, you know, re finished canoes, they're re it's best to use automotive type paint cleaners to, to keep them looking sharp. Um, so I would recommend a, uh, an automotive uh, compound, uh, automotive type slash cleaner to get that off. And then using a wax on that after will also help keep that algae off as well. Okay, great. I think we hit all those questions. It looks like Leanne, am I missing anybody? Um, Leanne, just a quick one popped on from uh, Michael Sim asking if he's heard to use the magic eraser to remove the scuffs. Is it too abrasive or what can we do to get rid of those paddle scuffs? Rubbing compound, 3M automotive rubbing compound yeah with a with a with a with a washcloth that i would i would recommend that over over any um magic erasers or anything that um that's kind of like that off the shelf uh you know quick fix solution like Really, one of the, the best ways to get those scuff marks off is just 3M rubbing compound and some elbow grease. Yeah. Okay. I, I, one of the other things too with your OC1 is, is when taking care of it off the water, um, when you're hosing it down, like make sure to run some water through your Yako sleeves too, because a lot of salt water likes to hide in there. And yeah. Thanks, Dan. Um, so for those of you, we're going to transition from Dan's uh, sort of bigger, more elaborate repair stuff to the more sort of mass unit, get your boat back on the water kind of stuff. Uh, but before we do that, I want to assure everyone that we are recording this session uh, and you can play it back later, but also uh, we'll be fielding a lot of these questions uh, and then providing a forum after the fact where we'll sort of provide resources uh, and some answers to questions that may not get addressed during this session. So uh, we'll thank Dan a little bit later uh, as we're closing in half an hour. We're going to end at 5.30, but we have a few minutes to spend with uh, Tristan Hayton. Uh, and I'm going to, I have the honor of introducing uh, Tristan. I've known him since he was uh, uh, a spry little brat uh, uh, as a teenager, but uh, uh, he's uh, grown up with the club. Uh, and uh, started by looking after great hordes of kids uh, during kids camps and then he took on more and more elaborate kind of repair and maintenance uh, jobs at FGPC and he's now our uh, equipment coordinator. Uh, we have a lot of club boats and club resources that are used on a day-to-day -day basis and when they get damaged uh, we can't afford to have them offline. So we may not have time to send uh, minor repairs out uh, so what we do is we repair them in-house uh, and uh, uh, Tristan is great with keeping our equipment uh, online at all times. Uh, and he's good at diagnosing uh, exactly what we were beginning with at the beginning of this meeting, which is 
he can diagnose what can be fixed safely and what does in fact need to be taken offline and, and go out for pro professional repairs. So we're very, very cautious about that. Uh, so uh, Tristan's gonna show you some of those tips and tricks and how he assesses uh, what can go back online and what needs to uh, go in for expert repair. So Tristan, uh, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Um, hi, can you, uh, everyone hear me okay? Perfect. So um, I'm Tristan. Um, I've been working for the club for a very long time and I like, uh, I've seen a ton of damage from very interesting things. Uh, things that uh, Dan and other people who have owned canoes and watch paddlers um, come as, as such a shock. Like, you know, you're not supposed to go on one side of a, of a green marker and they do it every time and, uh, and they end up kissing their rudder goodbye. Um, so rudders uh everyone knows someone or has damaged their own rudder before um and uh and and it's uh repairing a rudder can be a, a little intimidating um so i'll kind of take you through a little step by step what i do and then eric will probably ask me questions and things i forget about um so uh this is a hurricane rudder i think it's a surf rudder not 100 percent sure um but there's a couple of things I check. Uh, the first two things are the shaft of the rudder, and uh, and uh, when you when you pull the boat out of the water that that's hit ground or or uh, or been dropped or something like that, I check the shaft of the rudder and and see if it's bent. And the first thing you'll know if it's bent is if the uh, the end part of the fin here has punctured the hull. Um, that's a easy telltale sign that you've bent the shaft of the blade or the shaft of the rudder. Um, and, uh, and sometimes that can be fixed. Sometimes that can't be fixed. So, um, I have fixed a few bent rudder shafts by simply heating them up and bending them back by hand. Sometimes that works. And other times you're lucky enough that you can use these awesome plastic, uh, spacers that actually come usually with a spare rudder when you buy a boat here, I'm trying to find the camera. There we go. And uh, sometimes what we can do is just slide them on and uh, and space the rudder from the hull so that this point does not hit. Um, anyway, so that would be step number one to see if you, you, you've damaged the shaft of the rudder. If you can fix it with a, uh, a little shim or a washer, awesome. Um, if you can bend it enough uh, by hand so that this section clears the hull of the boat, then uh, then then you're then you're golden. Um, then the shaft is okay. We can use the shaft. Um, and uh, when we're pressure testing and 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 feeling the rudder and looking at it for damage, we really want to check this area here. This area here is very important. If you see cracks or anything like that, that means that uh, the connection between the shaft and the fin part of the rudder is compromised. And sometimes you can uh, fill it or impregnate it with epoxy. Um, um, other times you you have to throw that rudder out and uh, um, yeah so that's the shaft of the uh, of the rudder and, and what, how you check the uh, the damage um, on that. Um, the second stage would be to look at uh, at the actual um, fin part of the rudder. So this one had uh, as you can probably see this rudder should have continued, um, but uh, one of uh, one of FGP's lovely club boat users. Um, made a simple mistake and, and probably run it aground because we paddle in the ocean and, uh, and tide comes into play and sometimes the tide's a little lower than we thought. So um, shape of the rudder, it, was, it should, be, should have continued, but it had been hit on a rock and uh, the top coating had been uh, frayed and uh, had separated uh, what I guess you'd use vacuum uh, bagging uh, when fixing a boat to to suck everything back together. Um, so what I've done is I used a Dremel or a grinder, or um, you could do it by hand and take, a, take, take you a while, is you can reshape that edge. And it's rather fun um, um, to do. It's kind of uh, uh, artsy and, 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 and you get to reshape your, uh, your, your rudder. And uh, you can reshape it and then you uh, dip the end of it uh, once you've uh, uh, taken back enough of the rudder to where it's all um, uh, all the um, layers of the rudder, because each rudder from different companies is made up of different uh, um, layers. Uh, you can make sure that it's all sandwiched together and tight and the, um, whatever the adhesive is that's bringing that rudder together uh, is intact. And then you can uh, use a uh, epoxy mixture uh, of West Systems, which I'll show you guys in a second, to, uh, to coat the end and protect it from uh, delaminating. 
uh, in the future. Um, I'll show this is a hurricane rudder that had uh, probably about half an inch to an inch chopped off of the uh, the kind of the front bottom end of it. And uh, I have Eric Ages, uh, his rudder here. And I'm not sure if he ran his boat aground or uh, if he just decided to do this for fun. But instead of paying a small fortune for those uh, those um, weedless rudders or the little stubby short ones, that carbon ones that you can get for uh, Aries and other and other hulls, um, he made his own, and uh, and it worked really well. It took a Dremel and then took a uh, a bit of probably 400 or 600 grit sandpaper and built his own. And, uh, and then what you do is you just fill a, uh, um, um, mix some epoxy up and either coat it on with a, a brush or, or physically dip the, uh, dip the rudder in it, but then uh, it's all uh, coated and protected. Um, yeah, so that's ba base, basic kind of rudder repair. Um, that's what we do all the time. Um, I think we typically see one rudder strike or rock strike a month where it just uh, Im impacts the rudder. And uh, instead of buying new ones that I think some of them are well over $200, uh, we fix them in house and hope for the best. No, but uh, we fix them in house and make sure they're uh, sturdy enough to, to uh, be safe on uh, and for those club boats. Thanks, Tristan. Uh, I, I confess, I, I, uh, my rudder was not broken. I just chopped it off just because, but I have, I have other rudders, but, uh, that one, uh, I, I, I actually confess, I use that rudder more than any other now, even in the surf, it works just fine. But, uh, so, uh, what we try and do is maintain the life of these rudders before we have to replace them. But I do want to stress the fact that when it comes time, just as Dan said earlier, when a boat has passed its due date, that's the end. Uh, and the same is true with rudders. You have to make decisions based on safe, safety. You can't, you need your equipment to work. Uh, so we uh, salvage the equipment for as long as we can. And then once it's past its, you know, viable date, then that's it. We don't hang on to it. We replace it with new stuff. But Tristan, I think uh, Dan mentioned West Systems. We use the same uh, uh, family of epoxy. So maybe you can just show people what's involved with uh, with basic epoxy, because they're handy, not just for rudders, but all kinds of things, as Dan said, puncture repairs and that kind of thing. So maybe just go through that a little bit. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, actually, I've seen a few comments um, prior and I'm gonna go a little off script here. Um, I see a lot of people talk about rudder or uh, venturis, fixing venturis and replacing venturis and, um, and uh, a couple other things, but, uh, and 3D printing just came up in the comment section. Um, FGPC has, um, a wide range of staff with different hobbies. And uh, one of one of FGPC staff, uh, he has a hobby of 3D printing stuff and he likes to just make random things. So um, he he has actually 3D printed Venturis for us because on, on a hooky, they, uh, they stick out past the bottom of the hull. They're not sucked in or, or in, uh, in, um, built into the hull. Um, they actually interrupt the line of the hull and they, uh, and they often get knocked off um, when putting boats away most of the time, actually. And, uh, and so we've 3D printed stuff to uh, 3D printed new venturies rather than spending, again, a small fortune on replacing them. Um, West Systems Epoxy. Okay, so I'm gonna try my best here. I'm using my phone. Let's see, we got, we got a little bit of display. Maybe I can turn on my camera. Sorry, guys. Turn around the camera. Here we go. So this is, uh, I guess, what uh, what my workshop sometimes looks like. Um, West Systems. It's uh, it's a really good product, as Dan mentioned. It's kind of, I guess, uh, the the Rolls Royce of of, of epoxies. Um, so this is basically what we would need um, when repairing a rudder or even filling one of those small um, indents in. Uh, in your in your hull uh, that Dan would recommend you could do yourself and not uh, take to him or another um, expert. Um, so here we go. Uh, basically, what you'd want is a scale to measure it properly. Uh, we don't have to be too exact, but uh, exact measurements uh, do help. So uh, a basic scale. Uh, this is 105 resin. So this will be the bulk of the mixture. It'll be five parts 105 resin. And we use a fast hardener. This is a uh, 205 um, um, 
fast hardener because we often fix things in cold weather and we don't have the luxury of, uh, of getting our boats inside to uh, warm, cozy environments. So um, we would put uh, five parts 105 epoxy resin and uh, one part uh, um, 205 uh, fast hardener. There's also uh, a slow hardener. There's uh, clear. Uh, you'll see this one has a uh, I think this one's a clear and some have a red pigment to it. Um, anyway, so we, we turn on our scale here uh, with the cup. Uh, the, this is a West system, comes in a kit, uh, a scale. So this is how we know how much uh, mixture to use. So we would just uh, put our cup on before. So we zero out the weight of whatever you're using to mix the product. You'd click on, wait for it to zero out on the screen, which is probably hard to tell from my phone camera. And then we'd add the product. So uh, if we just do, uh, I'm doing this one handed, my apologies. One pump of it, put it back on the scale and weigh that. And then we take whatever, uh, uh, if it's five parts, 105 hardener, we take one part, one, uh, 205 resin. So that's roughly correct. So here's the, here's the fun part and the beauty of, uh, of, of West Systems, um, they have these amazing pigment options. And I think they have one or two more gray and, an, and another color. So after we've mixed our, uh, our 105 hardener and our 205, or sorry, our 105 resin and our 205 hardener, if we were doing uh, finishing off Eric's rudder here, which is already done and, uh, and done quite well, um, um, surprisingly <laughs> for Mr. Ages, uh, um, this mixture here, we'd, we'd want to add a black pigment to it. And it's, this stuff is awesome because basically we, uh, as soon as we, I might need to put the phone down here. As soon as we uh, put on this epoxy, we, uh, it's done. We, we wet sand it down to uh, make it smooth and pretty. And then... And I don't have a mixture, mix, mixing stick or anything, so I'm gonna use a pen. But welcome to uh, the busy, busy day of FGPC. Anyway, so I'm gonna put my phone down here and talk to you guys as I'm uh, as I'm mixing this up, and then I'll give you uh, the finished uh, the finished product. But anyways, mix it up here, and we end up with this uh, real solid black uh, epoxy mixture, and uh, and then from there we could coat it, dip it, or uh, apply it pour it on, move it around with your finger. I'd wear a glove, but, uh, but uh, in whatever way we wanted to cover up our, uh, our newly cut and angled rudder. Um, um, and then uh, you basically wait for that to dry. Why we use a, a 205, a fast hardener, is, uh, is because we live in cooler environments. We want to get more heat in our mixture. Um, and uh, sometimes we cheat the system and add a little bit more hardener, try and get it to uh, repair faster. Uh, it's not the best thing to do because the it's not uh, such a strong uh, bond um, in the mixture. But uh, it's once, uh, here's a here's a the real important uh, tip, but once you've mixed your epoxy and coated your rudder, uh, it is very important that you actually keep the cup out in a nice, nice area, not close to anything. Because if you've made the mistake, which um, I have many of times before, where I'm in a rush, I'm in an, an event or anything like that, and I use that five, five minute fast hardener or even do my own concoction, uh, um, it can sometimes uh, heat up and expand and, 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 and quite uh, produce a lot of fumes. So um, if you don't mix it right, or you put a little bit of extra hardener, um, to, to get a quicker uh, um, um, curing of the epoxy, then, uh, then you'd want to keep that cup separate and out of the way. You don't want to toss in your garbage, especially in your kitchen, um, because you might need that fire extinguisher that you're supposed to keep under the sink. Yeah, uh, uh, Tristan, Tristan's really right about the fact that it can heat up very, very quickly. You can leave it unattended for just a couple of minutes this, the, the epoxy uh, mixture can be quite stable and slow moving for a long time. And then it just takes 15, 20 seconds before all of a sudden it's going off and it can ignite uh, and it can cause uh, fire. So, I mean, Tristan's done a really great job of demystifying the process. I should also say, Tristan, 
the other reason that we keep those cups aside and watch them is because they're such a good analog for what's happening on the part you're repairing. So maybe talk about that because that's your go-to to see what's happening with the epoxy on the, on the repair because you can look at it in the cup. Yeah, for sure. Um, um, so, so for whatever reason, if you don't mix it correctly, it happens or you don't have access to a scale, um, it, you can get different, uh, different outcomes from the epoxy mix. You can have on the more extreme end where that, uh, where it kind of heats up, expands and fumigates and, uh, and, uh, and might cause a, a fire if you put it in your garbage. Um, and you could have the other end of it where it doesn't harden fully. And uh, so whatever your, whatever environment that you're fixing in, if you're in the middle of a hot Kelowna summer, um, then, uh, then your, your, your West systems epoxy mixture mixed correctly will, will dry probably to, to a T with what the label says. If you're on an FGPC docks in the middle of winter and, uh, you've got the heat gun out while it's pouring down with rain and, uh, and you're holding a plastic bag over your, uh, re uh repair on, the, on your boat, then, uh, then you might get some interesting, uh, uh, results, whether that be it's soft, it's, it's, it's gooey, like, um, like, like, um. I don't know if you were in elementary school and kids stuck dump gum underneath the uh, the desk and it it's not it's hard but it's it's not fully cured, um, and uh, yeah so that's why you'd, you'd keep that cup around longer to uh, really make sure that uh, that um, your epoxy mixture has cured. All right, thanks for that, Tristan. Tristan, there is a, a couple of uh, uh, questions. Uh, 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 the, the, the matrix underneath the carbon layers of the rudder, like when you chop them off or when I chop them off, um, the question is what's, what's inside the rudder? Uh, maybe describe that. I know all the different, like hooky rudders are different and so on. Maybe describe the different range of rudders. Um, so, so this is an Aries rudder. Um, it looks to be, I don't know exactly what it's called. Probably Dan could actually speak to this. I'm not sure how many rudders have, uh, have, Sorry, Dan, go ahead. It's, uh, it's the same foam that you see in the layups. Okay. Most oftentimes, yeah. Yeah, and then some of them, some of them you see carbon, carbon uh, exteriors or, car or carbon, uh, like the hooky, hooky rudders, uh, the weed rudders that uh, come factory on hookies have like a carbon layer on the outside. Yeah, they're, they're big. I built a, a ton of them for Kaiva'a. Basically, they are... Um, you got carbon on on each side of the rudder, and it's sandwiched with with foam in the middle, and that really is basically just to keep that rudder light. Um, and when it comes to when it comes to the foam being exposed on a lot of you know on a lot of rudders that people you know hit a ground and they don't take care of them like you're recommending, what happens is that foam starts to absorb water, and it starts to expand, and then it starts to delam. So when, if people, you know, do run up their rudder and don't take care of it, like how you're suggesting, they're really giving their rudder a short life. And yeah, so I'm, guess, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that's where a lot of the soft spots do come into boats when you don't repair that damage and water gets absorbed in and then it compromises the foam core of them. Right. And right. And then the other one too, uh, this isn't a problem that they experience in Hawaii, but here, <clears throat> um, when it absorbs that water, the, and, you know, fresh water, whatnot, when it freezes, that water and that foam expands just like ice does. And it, then it really causes a even worse delamination. Yeah, I, I should have actually brought up one of our hooky rudders. We have one that I just pulled off uh, of a boat and I think it went right into the garbage um, because the, the whole, uh, have the rudder here so uh, uh, the whole structure in here um it, it was all delaminating so you could actually hold this and hold the fin part and wiggle the two and yeah. that's a uh, you dan talked a little bit about um pressing down on the boats and and, and how you hear that uh, crunching noise uh between the two separated or fractured parts of uh a foam core that's that's when i, I kind of forgot to uh specify that earlier but when you wiggle around the rudder that might have uh, struck a rock or has, have been dropped it's super important to put your ear up nice and close and listen for any sort of crunching or 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 interesting noises coming from between these two uh 
these two parts here um, because that could uh, mean that you're paddling along one day and uh, and your uh, fin section falls off, which would not be good. And that's huge in a, in, a, in a downwind. If you were downwinding and your rudder was loose to the shaft, it could, it could, it could split right open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, for sure. Tristan, uh, Tristan, that's a really good segue. We only have a few minutes left, but uh, I think it's fair to talk about the discussion that you just had with respect to punctures and uh, penetration of water into the foam core, or whatever the substrate is, not just in rudders, but in paddles. So it's really, really important to do that same quick repair that Tristan just showed you and go ahead and, you know, pigment your epoxy, do whatever you want. Uh, use nail polish if that's all you have, but just make sure that your, uh, that the blade of your paddle, if you had a reef strike or whatever, that you fill it in or a puncture so that you're not shortening the life of the paddle or it does or you don't compromise it. So Tristan, maybe just chat about that briefly. For sure. So um, I'll talk about the, the best tool for that. And that are these, the plastic clamps, you know, those like a uh, handheld C clamps with a spring loaded. So they, they, they snap shut and then you, you clamp on them like a pair of pliers that open up and they have these big uh, faces on them. I can't remember what they're, they're called. We have a few of them. And uh, so what happens is if you, you get a rudder strike or, or something that this could, you could pretend this is your blade, your edge, your blade too. And it's, and it's splitting, it's separating. It's, the, these the the outer layer whatever it is that's um that that's has the foam compressed in between is flaring out you would uh, you could cut or or uh, on a blade you wouldn't want to cut away from that edge so you could uh, you could clean out that uh, those connection points and and just to prolong the life of a paddle you could use these clamps uh, once you uh, put epoxy uh, black pigment so whatever it is you're you're doing you're putting your epoxy resin in it you could clamp down to re uh, kind of like a cheaper way of uh, vacuum sealing or, or uh, when you're trying to squish everything back together and, and re-laminate it. Eric? Muted, muted. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, 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 it's really important not to allow water into rudders, into boats, into paddles. Uh, you know, they belong in the water, but you don't want water in them. So, uh, so I think, uh, Tristan, you've done a great job of demystifying epoxies and the kind of mash, like I think of Tristan as like Alan Alda in mash. Uh, most of you in the call are old enough to know who that is. Tristan probably has never watched <laughs> mash in his life, but, uh, but he's the guy that makes, that gets the soldier back in the field. Uh, and uh, Dan is the guy that takes a boat that may have really substantive repairs uh, needed uh, if the customer, the, beyond what the customer maybe even understands uh, and makes that boat safe again, or he's the doctor that will say, you know what, it's time to get a new boat. Uh, Dan's the kind of repair guy that would tell you that, and so would Tristan. And it's that kind of sincere approach and love of paddling that makes the best repair people. That goes back to the earlier question of, you know, how do you find a good repair person? Word of mouth and know that the people doing the work love the sport. And that's always really helpful. So uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to pass it over to Ron's for some closing remarks. We have a few minutes left before uh, before we wrap up for the day. Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. That was really informative. Uh, I think I probably have a repair uh, in my future with my boat. <laughs> um, okay, thanks for joining us. Uh, for the next um, video conference series, we, we've got a, a coaches session and that uh, will be uh, in two weeks. And um, it's gonna be on recovery secrets that you've never heard of. And these are uh, coming from Leanne and Val. So I, I've never heard of them myself, so. I don't know if you've <laughs> never heard them before, but since we just did boat maintenance, why don't we call it body maintenance? Okay, that works. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd like everyone to join us for, the, for that session as well. And uh, also a reminder that we've got uh, a new virtual uh, uh, OC1, our small boats uh, race series going on. It started last weekend and we've extended it a week so that um, you can submit your your uh, GPS times until May the 1st. Okay. Um, so thanks again, Dan and Tristan. Um, welcome. Very informative session. And um, I, I'm a um, reminder that um, we'll have a list of 
some of those uh, references that Dan mentioned uh, up on, on the CORA website that uh, people can refer to afterwards. And the session is being recorded, so if you want to come back and uh, re-watch or uh, refer the session to your friends, please do so. Thank you. Thanks very much. Have a great weekend. Stay safe and healthy and all that.